<laughs> tape on. How tape. you doing? Welcome back. Tape on, tape, tape off. Tape on. Tape on, tape off. Cape on, cape off. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you all today. Welcome to our show. We have a really big show here. It's an incredible show. It's going to be a great show. We're going to have a whole bunch of guests, and we're going to tell you a whole bunch of things, and it's going to make a whole lot of sense, and you're going to make a whole lot of money. That's the way it's going to be. See? New regime in town. What can I see? You don't agree? You're going to end up at the bottom of the sea wearing cemento shoes. You know what I'm saying, Ed? I hear you. What are you seeing happening in markets today? Not much today. today. Bullshit, I, I, didn't, I didn't see, see much today. I saw, like, a real... Is the market even open today? <laughs> yeah, maybe, oh, maybe it's closed. <laughs> Did you, we just declared a new holiday. You know, uh, yeah, I, I looked at a few of the bigger ones, like... Uh, bigger what? Bigger ones. What were you doing looking at those? Uh, <laughs> Why were you looking at big ones, Ed? The little ones aren't doing it for you anymore? Can't see the little ones. <laughs> I see. Easier to see. That's a good response. Now, that's an intelligent response in a... In a when uh, you get older... Smarter, you know, hope you can get <laughs> smarter responses. Uh, so let's see here. Let's um, see. We have Steve Meisner joining us today. Stevie and I are going to have a discussion about the general market direction, the market sentiments, the market catalysts. Right. The the poo. What's what's going on in the macro world? Markets are going down. Economics. It's all going sideways. Actually, if we were to uh, actually, you know what? You know what's going on right now, Stevie. Uh, is my if my NDI is functioning, I'm going to tell you. But looking at my chart right now, what we're seeing here is a actually in the Midas letter large cap index. Oh, you know what? Before we get to that, let's run through exactly what's going to happen today. Five minutes. We're going to have the headline news. Three ten. Steve Meisner. 3.30, Charting Man Dan is going to be here. We're going to have a quick Ask Me Anything at 3.50. The market close. Ed and I will run through some stocks and some charts. At 4.10, Philip Dumont, who's an economist, a freelance business and economics writer who is often seen on CBC, is going to be here to explain to us what the merits are of having a single unified national securities regulator and how likely that is to happen. Then at 4.20, we're going to get into the science Behind your high, not behind your eye. Not behind your highness. But not behind your hind, not behind your eye. Your hiney. Not behind your hiney, but your highness. Uh, what, is, anyways, what, would, what would your hiney be if somebody said, let me see your hiney. Tell all the girls they can kiss my hiney. That's a Frank Zappa lyric from, uh, what's that, Bobby Brown. And my name is Bobby Brown. Going to Montana. <laughs> That's a different song. Yeah, well, it's still the same guy. Bobby Brown. Bobby's hey there, people, I'm Bobby Brown. They say I'm the cutest boy in town. Anyways, I'm not going to sing the whole song, though I do know that whole album's lyrics word for word. Do you? The whole thing? I do. It's just some of my misspent use. While ute, while getting high as fuck, instead of paying attention to markets. Right. This is why right. I'm essentially not to be trusted as a stock market commentator, but who nonetheless uh, has a good time trying to be one. Anyway, so I wanted to uh, quickly look at this chart here. This is the Midas letter large cap index intraday today on my NDI. And if you look at what's happening, after 2 p.m. we have a major rally underway. <coughs> now, what is the cause of that, Ed? 2 p.m. rally. Big rally. What's going on? Got any ideas? To, to P or not to P? Well, that's a pretty yeah. big lift. 73.54 to 75.28. And what, what index? What, is that your, your cannabis index? That's the Midas letter you, you, large cap cannabis index. I, I, you know, I, I've been through a couple of these, these, uh, sell, these major sell-offs, and you get that, that first short cover rally, mm -hmm. and then it doesn't drop anymore. Right. And it just sits there, and by its time, it, the longer that goes on, I think the, the, the next move will be to the opposite of the sell-off well or to the to the, the initial move in other words we sold off short cover rally had a correction but then no more selling the selling seems to have disappeared for some reason hmm. and and uh that's because i think maybe everybody's done their tax loss selling. Yeah, they've done their selling but but you know this the, the people that are left probably are capable of holding on well, so you know they're, they're stronger but, but it, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see more rally here. Maybe we can figure it out if we listen to the news. And here's Ricky Gerwitz with that. Thanks, and here are the headlines moving markets today. 
Wayland Group has entered into an agreement to purchase 819 hectares of existing developed agriculture land in San Juan province in Argentina. San Juan province is used for cannabis cultivation due to the province's climate and altitude. Chiron Life Sciences Corp has signed an endorsement agreement with the Colombian Association for the Study of Pain, also known as the ACED. ACED has committed to partnering with the company on a schedule of patient and physician education programs, modules, and events. Formed as a chapter of the Washington, D.C.-based International Association for the Study of Pain, ACED is a 300-member interdisciplinary association of physicians whose goal is to study and harmonize all aspects of the research, diagnosis, and treatment of pain in Colombia under the guidelines of the International Association. M. Hardeen Group Inc. announced that the recently opened cultivation and extraction facility in Lower Sackville, Nova Scotia, owned by Atlantican Medical Inc., in which M. Hardeen has a 50% equity interest, has been granted a license by Health Canada for cannabis cultivation. The new 48,000 square foot cultivation and extraction facility has a production capacity of 6,000 kilograms per year, with expansion planned for an additional 20,000 square feet by the end of 2019. AMI intends to seek GMP certification for the facility in 2019. Tetra Bio Pharma Inc. confirmed its non-exclusive supply agreement for GMP Grade THC with US-based Rhodes Technology Inc. The supply will be used for several drug development activities, including Tetra's cannabinoid-derived products PPP002, PPP003, and PPP004, as well as for the Discovery Phase projects. This is in addition to having a supply agreement with True North Cannabis Inc. for CBD from hemp. Liberty Health Sciences Inc. has opened its first South Florida dispensary today in the heart of Miami. The new dispensary provides customers in Miami-Dade County access to medical marijuana products and educational services. Liberty also plans to open three more dispensaries this month with more to come in 2019, all subject to the receipt of Florida Department of Health approvals. And that's your news for today. Well, what do you think of that, Ed? Well, a lot's going on. A lot of uh, news. You know, you were, we were just looking at the uh, the, the size of the, the M. Jardin's. Hmm. I say M. Jardin, maybe it's M. Jardin, I don't know. M. Jardin. <laughs> I don't think so. Jardin. Yeah, no, Jardin is uh, how you say it in Spanish, and it's a Spanish word that means garden. Well, Desjardins. 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 The, gar the gardens. The garden. It's, it's French there. Okay, it's, we're going to bastardize all names and French languages there today, too. I can tell. It's That's French the way there it's too. Be. Anyway. Just like that there, huh? Um, so, so was that a lot of a lot of cover, a lot of acreage there for them? No, uh, not really. Not a huge operation. Forty-eight thousand, considering that Aurora Sky, in and of itself, is over eight hundred thousand square feet. That's a big operation. Forty-eight thousand, eh, not so much. You notice uh, you were talking about the index being up dramatically, and uh, mm -hmm. I just saw uh, Canopy go by up two forty on the day. That's a big move, five percent. Yeah. The canopy's got, uh, you know, it's got a, it's got a range that it trades within. Whenever markets are not, not decisively moving higher, so whenever markets are like drifting, canopy tends to bounce around between forty and fifty bucks, pretty reliably. You can make a lot of money trading that spread. Really? Oh yeah. If Simple. You, if you were to regressively analyze the stock performance charts on a day, in, intraday basis, over the last. Mm, call it, or actually call it intra-monthly basis, that every time he goes to 40, you put in a bid and, every t and offer it at 48, you'll get, uh, you, you'll make a lot of money doing that. Anyways. It'd be nice to be able to look at the next six months and see exactly what happens. Before what, hap happens. what does happen? That's, that's right. Okay. You know what I don't have is a rundown thing. Rundown. Sheet. Hmm. You ever feel rundown? I feel rundown. Thank you, that would be great. Um, so let's start off with uh, some conversations with some of our, uh, oh, people are making uh, reference to Ben's brilliant post on Twitter of Scotiabank's AFRIA report is great news for AFRIA longs. Thanks, Ben and Scotiabank. So Ben basically uh, sent us some information indicating that Scotiabank's take on the uh, short report from Hindenburg was that it was not very well 
not very well done, not very thorough, not very, therefore not very credible. And so it looks like uh, the takeaway is that, you know, it's a, basically a donut for anybody who is looking for longer term fallout from that short report. It certainly did get down to four, four and change. I hope that all the boys at Hindenburg and QCM covered on that because that looks like all the joy they're going to get out of it. Unless, of course, they can come up with a report that actually puts more meat on the bone in terms of the, the negatives surrounding both those companies. Um, so, yeah, uh, Manny P. Hey, Manny, how are you? Manny P is asking, hey, James, what's your take on FSD Pharma? Do you see them as a bigger player in the future? Well, don't forget, a FSD, not too long ago, I guess it was about six weeks ago, made that announcement that they had acquired a trading NASDAQ company for about $43 million. That company was trading at three fifty-four dollars something and change a share. Uh, that's a very curious transaction to me, and I don't know how they're going to do that. I mean, I think FSD has to apply to get on the uh, NASDAQ to be trading on NASDAQ. I don't think they can just buy a NASDAQ company and start trading. Although that remains to be seen. I'm, I'm just not very conversant with the mechanics of how that will work. So, you know, FSD is a really interesting beast to me. I mean, it's got probably the biggest float in the whole cannabis sector. Uh, it came to market with the biggest float in the history of the, of the CSE. It uh, had the biggest market cap of the CSE. It uh, traded more shares on the CSE. So, the thing I would say, the takeaway, the main takeaway on FSD Pharma is it is a curious beast that has surprised at every turn and therefore I would say do not discount future surprise potential. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. If, you're, if you've been surprised once, maybe you'll be, you'll be surprised again. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a shareholder and they're not a client presently. However, that could change. Uh, without any further notice, yeah. so there, there you go. There was a list published by, uh, uh, I believe Canaccord published a list of companies, their cash value relative to their market value. Okay. And I think uh, this company had the distinction of being at the bottom of the list. In other words, the, the amount of cash relative to their market value was the lowest percentage. Huh. And that would make that, that you could see why that would be because the market cap's very big. There's lots of shares. Yeah. Even though it's a low priced, mm -hmm. a billion three times thirty cents is still four four hundred million dollar market cap. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Um, I just want to point out here for you people in the audience that this Friday we are going to have both Cam Batley here from Aurora Technologies to talk about. Aurora Technologies, Aurora Cannabis, to talk about this, that, and the other thing, recent developments in their universe. And then after that, we're going to have Bruce Linton here to talk about developments. Uh, there's been a multitude of releases from the Canopy Camp, and we're going to hear from uh, Bruce on what's happening there. And so that's going to be a pretty interesting little Friday afternoon coming up this week. Um, next week on Tuesday, we have a gentleman uh, Peter Horvath, who is the CEO of Green uh, Green Brands, Green Brands, Green, GGB, Green GGB. Well, GGB. you don't know the name, use the ticker. Yeah, that's right, GGB. Uh, green Growth Brands, sorry, Green Growth Brands, GGB. Uh, also, we're going to have who else? We've got coming in. We've got uh, the new CEO of CanTrust is going to be here, Peter Aceto. Right. We've never had a conversation with him before. That's next week as well. So we've got a lot of great stuff coming up into this latter part of the year. And then Midas Letter is going on vacation for, mm, call it 12 days, I think. We're shutting down on the 23rd. Told you, we're, going, we're going down for the 12 days on of Christmas. 12 days of Christmas, my partner got for me two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. Very nice. There we go. Um, so yeah, we'll refrain from singing. Sorry about that. We'll try to try to keep the singing to a minimum. Um, let's see what else we got going on today, Edward. Well, okay. Uh, you know, Steve Meisner and I had a very interesting conversation. Let's take a look. At, let's take a listen to that. Steve, I wanted to start the conversation with the discussion about the general broad market weakness going into Q4 2018, what that means for 2019. 
Well, it's, uh, it's hard to say the setup for next year. Uh, it's interesting that, uh, first of all, uh, Black Friday was possibly a record setting uh, for online sales and, and pretty good for retailers, which shows that consumer confidence is very strong. It's interesting that the stock market in, in, in the aggregate is the only marketplace on the planet where people don't rush in to buy things when they're on sale. Mm -hmm. You sell a toaster at a discount, people are all over that. In fact, they're, they're, they're duking it out at Walmart to get a toaster, but you offer them stocks uh, at, a, at a lower price and, and it's a completely different psychology. Yeah. Uh, but the setup for next year uh, is, is certainly mixed signals right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, tax loss selling is always a, or I shouldn't say always, but is often a perennial discounter of stocks towards the end of Q4 as as portfolios start to window or as money managers start to window dress their portfolios towards the end of the year uh, but this year we've also got a little bit of macroeconomic weakness as a result of the china u.s sort of burgeoning trade war which looks like it could get hotter before it gets cooler and then of course we've got uh, uncertainty as a result of the fed walking back on its commitment to raise rates in the near term so all of those things seem to me have exacerbated the q4 end of year performance of stocks. Are those things likely to rectify and cause reversal in Q1 2019 or do you think that we're going to see more of the same? Well, let's try and uh, cover some of those points individually. Uh, the first part about window dressing just for your viewers, window dressing is a, is a I, I guess a term used to uh, for professional fund managers uh, to thin out the number of names they have in their portfolios. Typically, over the course of the year, they'll tend to buy more shares of different companies. Uh, and then by the end of the year, they would tend to weed and thin out, especially ones that haven't worked out are usually under more selling pressure. They're considered embarrassment positions and they don't want to show them. And since December 31st is still a key component of final year statements that will go out to individual mutual fund holders and, and such uh, uh, institutional accounts in the new year. That's the key snapshot. So you've got that weeding out or thinning out of the positions. Secondly, tax loss selling management is key. Uh, there have been some big gains this year, there pe uh, both for individuals and, and for institutions in certain segments. And so offsetting some of those uh, positions where there are losses uh, is prudent tax planning. Uh, pe people typically don't wait till December 28th or 27th to, uh, to, to liquidate these positions. They typically do them through October, November, and now we're into December. So tax loss selling is certainly a component and tax loss selling does lead to weakness in the markets. Uh, and also uh, the volumes are thinning out a bit right now. So you've got uh, fewer buyers around and that means that the selling pressure can uh, have a, a bigger uh, in, a negative impact on the market. In terms of uh, the Fed's positioning, I mean, the Fed has really two, uh, we've, we've discussed this on your show before, they have two arrows in their quiver. They have a big hammer. Uh, they have a big hammer, which is to raise rates, and they have a smaller one, which is to tell people they're going to raise rates, which is considered moral suasion. Uh, Greenspan famously during the tech bubble talked about irrational exuberance to try to talk the market down. Uh, but what we've been seeing now is actual sequential uh, hikes at the Fed, quarter point hikes, uh, but it was the rather aggressive uh, stance they took on interest rates at the Fed to say not just have we been raising rates but it was that uh, targeting or that uh, forecasting that they suggested would be a continued tightening stance and tightening means higher rates. Uh, the next Fed meeting I believe is around the 20th of this month so that's very soon. Uh, at, at one point it was deemed that uh, it was pretty much uh, considered de facto uh, that they would raise rates and at one point it was projecting that uh, rates might get another three hikes next year. Uh, that was a fairly aggressive stance and it was to, uh, to link up with the fact that we had 4.2% GDP growth in the second quarter which is huge, huge growth and, and they raised rates to try and temper excess economic growth and, uh, and, and try to avoid inflation. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so all of that notwithstanding, uh, to what extent do you see the burgeoning trade war with China, where now China has blocked the sale of a 15% of the phones available from Apple in China in a retaliatory move to counteract the arrest of CFO, uh, the CFO of Huawei, Huawei Corporation. Um, so that looks like to me that that could sort of continue to catalyze increasing weakness going into Q1 2019, especially if it doesn't get resolved. What do you see happening there? Well, I mean, it's it's obviously messy and it's creating concern. The market is focusing, the markets are focusing on what can go wrong right now and certainly a further escalation of, of tensions uh, between China and the U.S. Is, is not positive for the markets. The market's reacting accordingly. Each time the market rallies, we saw it last week, the Dow was up several hundred points and ends up go closing down on the day and we're seeing that today as well. I think it was up 370 at one point today and uh, has, has sunk back into negative territory the last time I looked. But uh, I think that uh, yeah, I think that there's still potential for uh, obviously uh, tensions to cool off. That this is I wouldn't say that arrests are necessarily part of a negotiating strategy, but uh, there's certainly room to uh, to put this away and 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 to to, uh, to to draw it back because there were positive talks even at the G20. The uh, that was the day of the arrest, ironically. Uh, up here in, in Vancouver when they were having dinner down in, in, uh, in Buenos Aires. So I think that there were constructive uh, messages coming out of there and uh, I think even today it was indicated that there might be some, I guess, better news coming out. But until there's tangible news, the tensions are going to lead to this uh, concern and probably not just volatility but, but volatility to the downside. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, oil and gas prices are in the crapper thanks to newfound inventories globally. Um, you've got commodity prices on the metals sort of wallowing around, you know, cyclical lows. You've got trade tensions. You've got the interest rates now being walked back in an effort to catalyze some positivity in the sentiment of investors. Is any of this going to have the effect that is desired by the Fed in, in suggesting they're not going to raise rates now? Um, do you think it's enough to offset the negativity? I think, I think that uh, in, in due time, even over a few quarters, it will, I think, have a positive impact. I mean, the market was uh, concerned because the projection from the Fed was the intention to raise rates up to three times next year. If you look at the futures market and uh, the bond futures are now indicating that, and the, even the shorter part of the Treasury curve are indicating that the market's not expecting that, uh, and, and we've actually had rallies in the bond market of late. So uh, the the uh, I think that's a positive. If, if we see maybe uh, rates sticking around where they are, uh, it's probably going to be much, uh, much more healthy for uh, continued reasonable economic growth out of the states, the, the largest economy. And I think that um, the consumer confidence is the key as well. And consumer confidence and business spending intentions, those are both uh, leading indicators. And consumer confidence obviously has been ripping and you know, tearing on the upside. It's been very, very strong in the US and we're seeing that in retail sales. When you have market volatility like this, and Americans are the biggest uh, American people as a citizenry in the world, have the largest exposure to uh, equity markets anywhere on the world. They have, on average, 60% of their net worth uh, outside of their home is, is, is in equities rather than in fixed income. So when, uh, as the stock market goes, so goes the psychology of consumer spending in the U.S. In Canada, the numbers are about reversed. 40% of Canadians' net worth outside their home is, is probably in stocks. Mm. Uh, just a general conservative, a more conservative posture. So when you have volatility, including downside downdrafts, it, it hurts consumer confidence. That means that the projections will probably be for a slower spending intention and that in itself will probably be signaling in, in addition to other factors like weaker commodity prices, which are also a leading indicator because of that long lead time to buy raw materials to manufacture, leading to uh, perhaps 
a general sentiment uh, both in the markets, which is key, and the Fed's actual intent that they don't need to raise rates as aggressively next year uh, or perhaps at all. That's unclear, but that's a positive underpinning for uh, the economy and thus profits in the stock market. Okay, so where do you see attractive opportunities? What asset classes, what segments within those asset classes in 2019? Well, right out of the gate, uh, uh, interest sensitives are probably, and, and we're seeing some attempt to rally some of those uh, utility stocks and, and even the bonds had rallied. So in, initially when you get this kind of dislocation and there was a sell-off in the interest sensitives uh, initially, um, I think that's, and, and when money comes back into the equity markets after being pulled out for cash until people figure out what they'd like to do, Typically, the money goes back in slowly, but it also goes back in in some of the most conservative elements of the market. And it could be argued that you need a, a flat to, to uh, a positive uh, uh, interest rate forecast, meaning a, a, a not, not a rising strategy, but, but a flat to easing strategy. I don't know if easing's on the forefront, but just a, a neutral stance is positive for equities, positive for the economy. So interest sensitives would be one of the first places to, to look, and that is a natural uh, pocket for money to come back in. And then on that basis, then uh, people will figure out where the, uh, you know, where, where the, where the beneficiaries of, of other market conditions are. And give me some examples of some interest sensitives. Well, uh, pipelines, uh, utilities, uh, uh, even REITs, Okay, uh, real estate trust sensitives for our audience. Uh, where where you have a dividend yield probably north of three percent, uh, especially in the U.S. because yields tend to be lower and and maybe three and a half uh, and higher in Canada. Those would be interest sensitives. Okay, great. All right, Steve. Let's leave it there. We'll come back to you soon. Thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Yeah. Well, Stevie's got it. Uh, nails it as per usual. You, you know, I'm 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 sure he's right when he says. As, as, as the markets go in the States, so goes the bravado of the consumer spender. Mm. Like you, you get your ass handed to you on, on your FANG stocks and all of a sudden, you know, maybe we won't take that trip this year. Yeah, maybe we right. won't buy, uh, buy all those luxury goods. <laughs> that's right. And, and uh, okay. Yeah, I just want to uh, draw, uh, draw your attention, Ed, to the fact that the cannabis large cap market has suddenly just got a fire lit under it. Uh, Aurora Cannabis at $8 a share backed off a bit. It was a little bit higher. It uh, actually touched 802. Uh, canopy growth up 6.24% to 44.28. It actually touched 44.59 just a short while ago. Uh, Afria is up 76 cents, up 10% to $8.28 a share. Kronos Group at 17.22, but uh, interestingly, the whole Midas Letter large cap index is up 5.4%, uh, which the majority uh, of that lift just came in the last 20 minutes. On, on my list, the biggest percentage gainer is hemp. H-E-M-P, it's up 34% today. Okay, hemp, so hemp is a, a small cap, so that won't appear on this list. Well, it, but, it, but you know, that there's one that, you know, maybe people are starting to look for bargains. Yeah. Because that's up 30, you know, there's a situation, you know, you buy yourself a million shares in the morning and sell it in the afternoon. Of course, you can't really trade a million shares, but <laughs> just saying. <laughs> no kidding, eh? Look at this. Um, Juju's number two, up 12.5%. No kidding. Doesn't take much. Ha. Huh. Well, you know, being Tuesday, Ed, you know who's here? Trading Dan. Yeah, not a bad, that's close, but listen to this. So Dan, let's uh, talk a bit about what's moving the markets around today from a technical perspective. Uh, certainly there's been nothing but weakness in the cannabis sector generally, but that's a reflection, I think, of markets, uh, the broad market globally. Is that what you would sort of see from where you sit? Definitely. It's always the S&P 500 recently that we are watching as step number one to get a gauge of what the market is doing, and it's still weak. Every little bounce is just a lower high. We still have uncertainty with Trump and China. And again, it's it's always a joke where, you know, you have the, the Canadian sector as its own little universe, but 
the Canadians that in our chat room sort of unfortunately now have to pay attention to Trump and you know all of these tweets that he's sending out. So the bottom line is, yes, we are still weak in the S&P 500, and yes, that is still causing weakness in the MJ sector. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's going to catalyze a reversal, and uh, do you see that happening anytime soon? Well, fundamentally, what would be a great start would be a, an inked deal between China and the U.S. and get rid of all this market uncertainty. The market certainly is not enjoying that uncertainty. Uh, that would be a fundamental reason. As far as technically speaking, we just need a change in the trend on the daily time frame, which is marked by higher lows and higher highs. And we're just not anywhere near seeing that at this point. So patiently waiting for daily trend changes to show a shift in momentum from weakness to a little bit of a bounce. Right. Okay. And so uh, it was interesting to me that the macro catalyst of Kronos Group uh, receiving the investment from Ultria and the you know over $2 billion investment didn't really catalyze uh, a sector-wide lift like the $5 billion investment by uh, Constellation did into Canopy. Why is that? Well, what the market does is it's really smart and it prices things in. So the reason that Canopy was such a big deal is it was the first one in the sector. So that's everybody saying, oh, wow, you know, this is legit. We're going to see real companies come in now. And so then everybody raises up all all the tides raise all ships. So now we had Kronos and it's a little bit of a lesser reaction. And yet again, everybody gets raised up. So Aurora, who doesn't have a deal yet, they saw a 7% response that day. So that's the market pricing in that Aurora is eventually going to get a deal. So I anticipate that the next deal that we get from a major company, if it's in line with what we've seen in the past, it's going to get even less of a reaction because the market has been pricing in that these deals are coming now for the last month plus and however long that we've been getting them. So I think it's just a little bit of a lesser effect each time we get this news. Mm -hmm. Okay, so technically heading towards the end of the year, are we in store? What's what's in store for cannabis investors? More continued weakness going into the new year, or do you think there would be some kind of a re reversal to the upside? I'm keeping an eye out for a, a short term bounce, which would last maybe a week or two. It wouldn't change the long term weekly trend. It would just set a lower high on the weekly time frame. And I'll point that out here in just a moment. But other than that, it's it's not looking like we're just going to see. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of disheartened people out there. And again, like you said, the fact that this Kronos deal was not a catalyst and that's going to further dishearten people. So we have to go through the emotional cycles and the market cycles, and it's going to reach a point where everybody's bummed and everybody's bored and things are slow. And that's when we'll start to shift that psychology and momentum in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, before we get to the charts, any macro catalysts out there on the horizon that you see that might be a sector-wide raising of all boats? Aside from federal changes in the U.S. that would obviously impact the U.S. sector the most, but Canadian sector would definitely get an impact as well. That is the golden goose egg of what the market could be looking for right now would be federal U.S. changes in laws. Sure. Okay. And uh, why don't you walk us through the chart now? So here what I'm looking at is CGC on the weekly time frame. And what I was talking about, the possibility to see a couple week bounce, CGC can get anywhere all the way up until 46.74 and still just form a lower high. So we're not going to change any kind of trend. We could see a 20% bounce and still just form a lower high. So there is a possibility, you know, heading into the new year for a short term bounce. But again, without any kind of significant catalyst, it's going to take a long time for these trends to shift. And what we're essentially going to have to see is a move up, set that lower high, pull back for a higher low, and then the higher high would change the trend. So that's going to take weeks and weeks to play out without some quick catalyst to do the work for the bulls. So what I want to talk about now is what I look at when I'm comparing individual names to know who's stronger in the sector and who's weaker. And we just had the recent news event with Afria with the whole short scandal. And that is a date that is important to me, December 3rd, because that's the date where the vast majority of individual names saw weakness. And we pulled back very hard from that. So what I want to know is who is still below the December 3rd high and who has fully recovered and is above that level right now. And we can see that CGC is nowhere near breaking its December 
December high, so it's a bit weaker than everybody else. And when I go through and compare to other individual names, here's Aurora, and I see the December 3rd high of 787 on the Canadian side of things, and here we are breaking that level today. So we've made a V-shaped recovery. We've taken back that weakness that we saw in correlation to that Afria short piece, and that's a recovery. And what I'm also noticing is that the vast majority of US names are seeing that recovery as well. Here is NBEV, NBEV. We have an uptrend here. This is a, a month long uptrend of daily higher lows and higher highs. And we don't have many names in the sector that have such a clear uptrend and certainly not on the Canadian side of things. But NBEV is showing a lot of strength. We've got CWEB with a V shaped recovery back over the high of December 3rd. We've got IAN also over the high of December 3rd with a V shaped recovery. And KSHB is another one that has an uptrend and is topping out a little bit of resistance. But the bottom line is uh, seeing an uptrend, again, stands out in such a weak sector right now. So I'm comparing individual names to where we stood the day the bad news came for Afria. And here's Afria right now. Here's that gap down day on December 3rd. And Afria is still trying to make its own recovery. But the bottom line is I'm seeing more strength in the US side of things than the Canadian side of things. That can be potentially attributed to the farm bill. And what's interesting about the farm bill in the US is it's not this kind of singular news event. Like, you know, we get a news release that there's a deal with Cron and that's set in stone. Whereas this is sort of, you know, kicking the can down the road a little bit. We get word that there's an agreement reached and then we get someone signing the bill and then it has to eventually go on the desk of the president to sign. So we price it in piece by piece rather than all at once with a big gap up open. But I do believe that that's the short term catalyst that is pushing the USMJ names a little bit stronger than the Canadian names. So what exactly is the nature of that catalytic force in the farm bill? What is it going to do for the valuation of uh, US operators? Well, it's going to open it up federally to be legal for industrial hemp in the United States, which hasn't happened in you know 90 years since it's been made illegal. And that's essentially just going to open the door for expansion. The next major catalyst that I'm looking for is for it to, for marijuana to be removed from Schedule One, because that's going to open the door for the banks to get involved. And then we're going to be able to see you know significant funding in these companies to allow for that expansion of operations. <laughs> So there are certainly companies that are operating with their industrial hemp in individual states that have already legalized. This just opens the the gates in terms of expansion and you know where your your mar target market can be spread around the country or where your operations are spread around the country. So it's not you know the holy grail, but it is definitely a step, and it's also going to incite the confidence in the U.S. investor that okay, we're actually are getting. You know, government changes. Government can certainly be slow and, and long and drawn out, but changes are happening. And that's going to make us see people get excited for descheduling and get excited for potentially seeing some further, longer, major changes in the marijuana space in the United States. Sure. Do you think there's a risk that the uh, federal deprohibition or ratification of CBD legislation is going to catalyze a supply side surplus resulting in price competition? Oh, I'm sure it is. Right now, CBD is definitely very expensive, and I do expect prices to drop as supply does increase, and we'll reach an equilibrium of prices eventually. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. The same way that we will with cannabis, you know, prices are going to drop as people get better at producing it, and and their prices drop as well. So, it's something to be aware of longer term, absolutely. And that's where a lot of people feel that the MJ companies that have value added products are the ones that are going to be surviving not the ones that are you know potentially just growing the bud but the ones that are turning it into edibles or turning it into concentrates and all these other products that's where a lot of people see the potential profit margins mm -hmm. okay so coming back to your uh your observations about the companies that have fully recovered versus those that are still trying to stage recovery um, do you think that the, like Charlotte's Web, for example, has staged a full recovery so that it's recovered all of its lost ground? Does, does and you, you say that that might be in part driven by the farm bill. Do you think that the, as we inch closer, inch closer to the farm bill that these U.S. names will continue to outperform that have big exposure to CBD products? 
I do believe that that is a potential short-term catalyst to continue outpacing Canadian MJ names to a certain degree, but it also gets to the point where it gets priced in. So we know that the farm bill is most likely going to get signed and the market is really good at reacting to what's most likely to happen. So when it actually does happen and we're actually finally seeing it signed by the president and it's the real deal, I don't expect any kind of significant bullish reaction because each step of the way it's been priced in into the market. Right. Okay, Dan. Well, fascinating as usual. Really appreciate your input and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for joining me. Charting man, Dan. He made a lot of good points. I got to be honest with you. Like I like I like the way he thinks. I wish I could ask him one question. What's that question? Well, yesterday, I'll ask him for you. yesterday the S and P took out the lows. Yes. In the morning, yes. and then they rallied back and yes. closed above the lows that were set way way back. So that that low was a closing. The closing side of that candle was above. But it, when you see that, it's it's it's, it's a. I, I love to see that. And I think it augurs well for the markets. I'm not high or low. Well, it, but it, but it took it, it created a lower low, but it didn't stay there during the day. There was there was serious support, and and it, it created a, a a nice hammer. Okay. If I had a hammer. Yeah. All right. Anyway, you know, there's a million ways to look <laughs> at these things. You mean you don't have a hammer, Ed? Well, I, <laughs> somebody cut it off. Uh, I, don't know. <laughs> I guess I do. I don't know. All right. Uh, Great. Well, so stocks are still trading uh, quite energetically here in the latter part of the market day. But uh, not frenetically. Not frenetically. But Supreme energetic. Pharmaceuticals put on three cents, trading at a dollar forty-six. Uh, hemp. Hemp. Eighty cents to a buck fifty in about four days. Whoa! Where are we? Why? How does that happen? Because we're not looking at it. Is that right? It's a stuff. So if we move. look at it, it ain't gonna move. It's not gonna move. Especially if we buy it. Are you suggesting we're coolers in that regard? You know, like the. Coolers. Well, I got a call from the producers of that movie. They said, "Would you like to <laughs> stand in?" <laughs> yeah, well, that, that was a great movie. It that was, was a, a good movie. movie. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, what are we uh, what are I, we going to do? I'm Ed? looking at a lot of things that look like they're catching a bid, and I I think I'm, I'm I was short the C R O N took a little little spank in there. Yeah. But the way it's acting right now, it looks like it's slowly chewing through up. Okay, so uh, the, it threw up. Yeah, it threw, threw up. up. It threw up. Barfed basically. It barfed. It barfed. No, up it's, some it's looking like it's getting ready for a move higher. Yeah, the okay. sector looks higher to me. Okay, well, it's, it is the cannabis sector. It should be higher. <laughs> uh, okay, I want to so, take you higher. So, do you know of any catalyst market wide that would uh, suggest that justification for why suddenly we're getting this end of day uh, effusiveness in the market? Can I? I don't can I? Uh, uh, can we take a little walk down memory lane? Would you want me to come with you? <laughs> you know, when, when Constellation Brands did that deal with Canopy, yes. if you look, there was an immediate move, and then there was a few day lag, and then they all kicked in. If you, you go back and look, it, it's sort of like what's going on right now. It's like we're sitting here, what's mi market's moving up, and we're going, well, can you think of a catalyst? Well, maybe we had the catalyst. It's just going to take a few weeks for it to. So you think Kronos getting the investment for 2.4 billion from Ultria it, was the catalyst that is now moving the market? It's starting to, yeah, spreading. Really? Yeah, and I think we saw that with uh, Constellation Brands. No, I don't think so. I go back there. <laughs> okay, say I'm going to look it up. All I'm right. looking it up. You pull up a chart, Ed. I, I, I honestly, as I recall, the response was. Immediate and profound for Canopy shares upon well, the announcement. Here we go. Here we go. Well, he's going to prove me wrong. So, so here's the move. Okay, look, time for pen. All right. This means you're going to draw on a chart now. That's a bit a bit, bit concerning to me. So, so, so this is this the thing closed down in here. It, it was around 32 bucks, if I recall. Where? Back in uh, the day before. We don't see where you're referring to. Oh, how come? Oh. Is my MDI working? Yeah. Oh, you, you got your NDI up. We need That's not mine. Yes. <laughs> it's not? No. Whose is this? Well. <laughs> Three day move. That was yours. Try again. Okay, okay, so so we had three days of we had a bump and it moved sort of sideways three days and it started moving up every day, okay? Yep. Now but let's go to let's go to uh, Let's go to where? <laughs> uh, here, here, I'm. Oh, come on, come on, people. 
help me out here. What's going on? You having technological issues over yeah, there, uh, Edward? Yeah. So there we go. So let's look at let's look at. I want to look at uh, Aurora, for instance. So that's ACB, right? Mm -hmm. CA. Okay. Here we go. So here 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 was the. Uh, what day was that? Back in here. So went one, two, three days, then up. So when did this happen? A week ago? Well, you got a point. I don't know. I, I kind of remember it not taking off. In other words, it, it took off three or four days later. Hmm. And here it is three, or three days later. Hmm. Interesting. So uh, we have a trivia question, Ed. It's not a trivia question. It's an ask me anything. And what is that question? How reliable is a robo-advisor? It probably does exactly what it's supposed to do. Mm. Like if you're asking it to, you know, solve a very difficult physics question, I don't think that's going to happen. Okay, so for the sake of our audience, let's first describe what is a robo-advisor. And a robo-advisor is essentially an algorithmically predetermined investment under the category of AI. Under the category of AI, but, potentially. But, but primitive AI. But probably Might a little more advanced than most of the brokers that are on Bay Street. <laughs> so essentially, no offense, guys. basically, I used it's to be a broker. <laughs> designed to achieve a, a certain steady, consistent performance that will be modest relative to higher risk uh, portfolios, but will be consistent, which is what people who invest with robo-advisors look for First and foremost, you know what I think a robo preservation above appreciation. A robo advisor will tell you you take some money off the table if you've got a big gain, whereas you may not do it because you're greedy. Right. That, that, it, it'll take out some of the emotion that makes you that makes a human make mistakes on a regular basis because most humans robots make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> really? If you never don't you remember uh, George Jetson's robot? What was her name? Uh, here's George Jetson. Cousin Ed? No, 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 that was Cousin Ed. You're, you're, you're way off. Cousin Ed. That's the uh, Adams uh, family. Uh, uh. Boy, they Mar weren't Morticia. even animated. Morticia. Morticia, yeah, but she wasn't a robot. <laughs> it's the Jetson's family maid. What about, uh, was named, what was, what was the name of the Jetson's family maid? Whoever, whoever can get that, uh, uh, gets a huge prize. What's the? What was what, it? What would that huge prize be, James? Uh, I... Well, a kiss. That's <laughs> a like kiss. a Hershey's kiss? No, like a smack on the lips. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, what was her name? Whoever can remember George Jetson's maid's name? Gets she was a, a robot, but she... Rosie McNally Investing. <laughs> McNally Investing wins. Ding ding ding. Mm, 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 mm. There, there's the kiss that you win. Um, yeah, that's pretty good. Do you remember Rosie? She was not probably a great advisor. She did make mistakes, which occasionally caused some problems for the family. But, uh, you know, overall, she was a very talented maid who kept the place clean, which in the space age of the Jetson family was probably quite important. Yeah. Get a little dust in that uh, sonic defibrillator, and who knows what's mm. going to happen. Mm. Rosie. Yes, we got that. Ah, Thank you. Thanks. Uh, look at the, the Rosies are pouring in now. Everybody's got Rosie. Well, everybody wants, they know it. It's easy. Oh, Ivan says he'll pass on his kiss. Come on, Ivan, live a little, will you? Jesus Christ. It's the, it's the 2000s. En français, we'll play. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what oh. made you think you were going to get a kiss anyways? Uh, so, anyways, so we're still looking for anybody got any idea what the macro catalyst is in the market that has caused this late afternoon enthusiasm. More buying than selling? Well, there's definitely more buying and selling because the stocks are going yeah. up. Does now, it really matter what the reason is? Uh, well, it does matter what the reason is because if you don't know what the reason is, then you're not going to be able to identify the reason for the reversal and get out in front of it. Traders react to ch trends. Traders react to trends. Well, look at all the markets are positive now, but definitely the large yeah. cap market is leading with 5.5% increase. And those are all the caps over billion dollars. Uh, uh, second runner up would be the venture index. So that's a pretty weird combo. The large caps and the ventures are leading. And uh, 
And Are then you talking the about your, indis your indices? Your yeah. yeah, the Midas letter indices. Okay. Yeah. So let's see. Who's look the big this. winner? Look at this. Look at LHS up 11 cents. Liberty Health up Sciences, 37. Yeah, I'll tell you, six. you, you got to be, if you're short this market and you didn't cover already, you may find that you're going to wish you did. You're going to have something you're holding in your hand. Because these things, I'll tell you, that nothing makes a short nervous like seeing the market go up when he's expecting it to go down. Because he has his way and thinks, ah, I'm genius. Who? He, he, the, the, the shorter. The shorter? shorter? Yeah. Are short, shorter short? Yep. <laughs> Generally. <laughs> Yeah. There's no tall shorters? Is that a prerequisite for being a short strategist? You have to be short? Yep. To be short, you have to be short. Because if you're not if, short, what do you... How can you be short if you're not short? Well, then you're long. Then or you're, tall. Or tall. <laughs> long, tall Sally. Oh, boy. That could get confusing really quickly. Okay. Anyways, uh, let's see who's leading in the uh, CSE space here. I'm going to pull up this... Uh, not that chart, but this other chart. We're going to look at the CSE index here on my, and see who's 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 the big winner here. Who? 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 Well, on a percentage basis, the leader is actually Lifestyle Delivery Systems, which has gained 12.8 percent. Liberty Health Sciences is up 11.58 percent to a dollar six, up 11 cents on the day. How's that for a smackdown on the? Hot Hindenburg research report. You, you, you know how, but we've seen it where just when you think, it was like the day when all that paper was going to come free trading on that one issue. Yeah. And we said, you know what? It may just go up because they, they've already anticipated. Exactly. Yeah. Ianthus added 4.6% today, which is good because it's still way below where I bought it two weeks ago. See, I, I waited in too soon. I should have waited till more of the stop loss selling had taken the market lower. Who knew that, of course, who knew that they were going to arrest the CFO of Hawaii? Hawaii. Hawaii. Hawaii Corporation. Why, it's, I think you it's have pronounced. A Hawaii phone? I got a, yeah, I do. So in, that phone in fact, is every time I, I talk right to now. somebody, no, I'm, I spy on everybody with this phone. Really? It's got a spy you, feature. You spy on the, really? Yeah. You just put it on spy mode. Spy mode. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it's pronounced Y way. Y way? Yeah. It's like, not, if it's not my way, it's the Y way? If it's not my way, you want to take the Y way <laughs> or the highway? Why way? I don't know. Why way? I, I think you know. There's a little bit of uh, you know. People are jumpy. People don't like to see someone crowding well, your space. It's Christmas time. So they're picking on this company because it's making inroads. Yeah, I don't think so. I think they probably didn't like the uh, architecture of their software, which was built with all kinds of backdoor architecture of their software and their hardware in terms of uh, internet infrastructure. In right. other words, if you were deploying Huawei 5G towers, the forces that be on the technical side were looking at the architecture and going, there's no way we can guarantee that there's not a back door in this system because it's complex and it's convoluted and we don't like this. So that's what happened there. And you know, if I was a betting man, I would say there's more to this whole scenario than meets the eye. Because for one thing, China threatening Canada with serious repercussions if it doesn't release a lawfully arrested fugitive from justice. First of all, that's completely consistent with China's absolute lack of the recognition of the rule of law, which despite the G7's, mm, let's call it uh, kowtowing to the Chinese Republic and entertaining them despite their absolutely horrific and probably world's worst human rights abuses legally, never mind their absence of democracy and their predation against their own citizenry. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's A. Yeah. But B, I think that the U.S. and the Chinese trade war is actually a bit of a geopolitical cold war. What do you think about uh, them, Apple? Yeah, you know, you know what, look, at, you make great points, but it, 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 I, I, I only get... It, it seems to me this is getting more complicated, and every time something happens, and you know, you know, they, 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 Trump and this Chinese guy, they, they agreed that they would have a little cooling off period for nine months or three months, and then two days later they 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 call up the guys in Canada and say arrest her. Yeah. Whoa! Doesn't that make it more complicated to make a deal? I would Obviously. think. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, we'll see. It's gonna. Be, it's interesting. It's good. Uh, it's very confusing, really. It's, it's a good uh, for us guys on the street. Opera. It's it, good soap well, opera. It's, you know, a little bit more than that. Disturbing. Yeah. You know, they're Just, building aircraft carriers now. Anyways. Yeah. Um, and, and you should see what they look like. What the aircraft carriers? Yeah, they're faster than ours. Really? Whew. We don't have any. Well, Canadians. No wonder they're faster. <laughs> <laughs> you can't land planes on our aircraft no. carriers, Ed. No, you can't. Which well, is really strange. Especially our planes. Anyways. Um, we got a new uh, new gentleman in the mix, and I had a conversation with him, and and uh, here's what he had to say. <laughs> so, Philip, I wanted to tackle an issue here that yep. is of extreme interest to everybody in capital markets across the country, yep. and that is the uh, Supreme Court has given the green light for a unified pan-Canadian securities regulator <laughs> to govern the country's financial industry. People in some quarters are quaking in their boots, and yep. in other quarters they're cheering from the rafters. Which should we be as retail investors? Well, I mean, to some degree, you, if as a retail investor, what you want to be is happy with a single regulator, if you get it, because right. it's not obvious you're going to get it. They've been trying since 1934. They've had references to the Supreme Court before, which didn't work out, okay. because fundamentally the Constitution works against a single regulator in some sense. Mm. So they came up with this cooperative idea, right. and people have to sign on. So you've got everybody signed on except Alberta and Quebec, mm. and you've got politics in play. That's why we didn't get it before. That's why we might not get it this time. For an investor, though, I've, I've never been a big fan of provincial regulators, not because they're not well-meaning people, but there tends to be a bias. Nova Scotia has a regulator, absolutely fine people. But when you go down there as a company and you kind of say, well, we want to list in this certain way because we can't list on the TSX, okay, we might kind of accommodate you a little bit. Like, not necessarily throw the dog out, but it's a bit like, okay, if you're an investor down in Nova Scotia at one of those stocks, you gotta kind of go, okay, am I sophisticated enough to play, it's a shell company doing this and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. The, the OSC, the TSX, you could kind of go, or even the Quebec Exchange by itself, you could kind of go, these guys play hardball, I can kind of be protected. Vancouver, when the VSC was up, little more of a close to the, you know, you're slicing the cheese pretty close. Yeah, okay. And that becomes a bit of an issue. So if you're, if you're an individual investor, but if you're a lister, you probably don't like the single regulator because essentially it'll devolve towards the OSC kind of regulations. That's kind of what they'll be looking mm -hmm. at. Okay, so essentially from an individual investor's perspective, it's a good thing, but from a listing issuer's perspective, it's complicated then? Well, I mean, the problem always was if I was a mining company with odd kind of, an odd kind of a situation, because if you were a straight up mining company, you'd go with the TSX to some degree. Right. So you wrote in Vancouver, the whole argument was you don't understand the mining industry in Ontario. So, well, so okay, so they started doing various kind of things. It's the equivalent of the MERB issue. You okay. know, the, those kind of, we'll shell it this way, we'll do it this way, we'll do a bit of a reverse takeover. And that stuff's okay. Nobody's cheating, you know, cheating or anything like that. But as an investor, I mean, I'd never go there. Right, right. Because it's like, okay, the risk is I'm gonna get skunked. Mm -hmm. uh, and the upside, yeah, if I got a, dollar and a 50 stock, it might go to four, mm -hmm. but it might go to zero. So I, you know, I'm a conservative investor, I go to the OSC, or that kind of a, a situation, because they're basically gonna protect me, and I'm looking for four or five percent. I'm not looking for, for 50. If you're looking for 50, yeah, you go to the, the, uh, the venture exchange, those kind of situations, and the listings are a little different. So that became kind of the situation. Alberta, uh, Quebec, Quebec's more of a sovereignty issue. Mm -hmm. Alberta's more of a you don't understand our industry issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the dog's kind of barking on that one. Right. Okay. I mean, you just don't uh, like it's going for a while, but everybody's kind of running from the same uh, hymn book now a little bit. And if you're an individual investor, you really want to be protected because it's nice. Look, I'm not an idiot, but I'll go out and read these prospectuses and kind of go, okay, I'm not quite seeing. It. And then you'll talk to Steve or you'll talk to you, and it's okay. Here's what really is going on. Oh. Right. But if I'm just doing it on the exchange, uh -huh. you know. Okay, so if Alberta and Quebec do not sign on to be governed by a single regulator, yeah. does that mean there will be no single regulator, or will we have a single regulator just X of Quebec and Alberta? Well, I think there's two things going on. One, BC signed on, and they were always difficult before. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a plus on that side. Right. The, the negative side is, it used to be the Quebec nationalism issue. Right. I don't think that's the issue anymore. Nationalism's kind of died in Quebec. They they kind of raise the sovereignty flag because it's a little more of a domestic voting issue. It's the Alberta exchange. Right. And the problem is, is that if you think that Trudeau has not done enough on the pipeline issue, then what you can do if you're the Notley government is say, look, we need protection on, you know, you don't understand our industry, so you can't force us into the single regulator. 
Uh, the flip side is that it's not really a high salient issue anymore. Mm -hmm. If I'm not in Alberta, I, I'm not going to trade pipeline movement for, okay, you didn't do anything in the pipeline, do something on the Alberta Stock Exchange or the Stock Exchange out there, or the regulator, do something on the pipelines. Sure. So just keep pushing it on that. So you can make the argument that Alberta's the the company in, or the province in the way, mm -hmm. uh, but I think at the end of the day, it really comes down to this. Does Trudeau want to do this before an election, which could make some sense, get it out of the way, or does he want to not take any risk in terms of any kind of a sovereignty fallout, do it after an election, and then you're pushing it off because you're rolling the ball down the road, you don't know when it actually stops. Okay. So I'm thinking of all of the provincial regulators and all of the prospectuses I've looked at who, yep. you know, occasionally there's omissions as to which province or territory yep. companies get registered in. But in general, I find it difficult to detect the differences on a province to province basis in terms of securities regulations. So can you give me any examples of specific differences that are unique to certain provinces or groups of provinces? Well, I'm not really thinking of specific regulations, but here's an example. Halifax, uh, Halifax Nova Scotia used to have different incorporation regulations. Hmm. It was cheaper to go, and basically the argument became, if you had whatever the fee was, a couple of people in an office, you could list in, in Nova Scotia. So all of a sudden, all these companies on the TSX were domiciled in Nova Scotia, even though there was, all they had was me mm -hmm. in an office. Right. And so it's that kind of a thing, and the problem isn't so much Again, these you know, it's not like they're stupid and the only smart people are in Toronto or in Ottawa. It's more an issue of they're kind of fighting for sovereignty issues. So there used to be a push to have a, a maritime stock exchange because mm -hmm. they viewed it as you don't understand our market, it's better for capital listings. And my dad was a stock worker for a million years. He kind of scratched his head at this and said, well, but, but it's not like Toronto people don't get on the phone. <laughs> and so you get into this debate. So if I'm in Alberta, you know, you don't understand, we want to do these kind of reverse takeover vehicles and it's easier to list. I kind of think it's not, just list the friggin' list. Yeah, right. And do it that way, because if not, you're gonna ask a question. If you got eight other provinces on side, and Quebec's kind of out there because that's Quebec and you leave them alone, it's Alberta. Well, if I'm listing in Alberta but nowhere else, or that's kind of the argument, I'd be going, ah, Mm, it's like op it's like being a state with open gun carry. Okay, I'll just stay in these states and stay out of those bars down there because right. they got guns. Right. And it's that kind of problem. Why would I walk into a place where they're going to be starting shooting at me, whereas I can mm. go here and I can get some vehicle similar to whatever's out there, mm -hmm. and I can do it in Toronto. Okay, so it's been 80 years that the provinces have been fighting the feds. The feds want this. The provinces aren't necessarily yeah. supportive of it. Now we've got some broad-based support. How likely is it that this is actually going to go through this time? Well, I mean, it's better than it was, partly because the late Jim Flaherty, he pushed it, and there's some momentum among finance It's, it's in a sense, a nonpartisan issue. You're not going to have a conservative finance minister that far from uh, Bill Morneau, mm -hmm. or far from Michael Wilson in the old days, or whoever it is. So there's much more push. The problem becomes is, you know, Trudeau is not that popular right now. Uh, he's looking to w try to win an election next year. So does this become an issue he can hang any kind of a hat on? I mean, uh, here would be a political way to look at it. Uh, investors, Bay Street, tends to be conservative. So if I'm a liberal government, am I going to do this for you? Am I going to get, okay, you might not vote for me. Am I going to get money out of you? Can I go down to Bay Street and have a fundraiser and have a bunch of people give me some dough? <laughs> if not, it's kind of, you know, like I was a political guy for a while. I'd be saying, no, go where the money is or your votes are. Don't go where they're not going to vote for you, not give you money and give them something. It's, it's, don't do it. Right. Because you've got a million things you're going to fight on. Right. And, you know, for Bay Street, it's like, well, why wouldn't he? It makes perfect sense. Yeah, but he's fighting pipelines and he's fighting native, you know, issues. He's fighting a bunch of stuff. So he puts it in a different mixer. So for Bay Street, it's a one issue. And, like, why wouldn't they do this? But then at the same time, they want to reduce the deficit. They say, well, you can't have both. You want the deficit, you want this. It's that kind of an issue. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so then are there any industries that would benefit from this? amalgamation of governance across the country relative yeah. to other ones? Well, I mean, one thing you could look at is some of the softer kind of issues we look at, and you don't really think of those regulatory issues, climate change, uh, women on boards, for instance, diversity, because with a single regulator, let's take climate change, you dumped cap and trade, which I think was kind of dumb because it's a market-based solution to that problem. Okay, so now all of a sudden you've got regulatory concerns about what cleanup, let's say the Alberta oil well cleanups are going to cost. So you need to kind of list that kind of an idea. So what they're going to kind of do with those kind of regulations, if you have a single regulator, is 
you're going to have to list this stuff. You're going to have to go and figure out what it's going to cost, and you're going to have to list it. Everybody's going to have to list it. So if I'm buying from oil driller one, and there's a future cost that government's going to make me pay for cleaning up the oil wells, okay, I know it's a, um, $100 million in 2025. Mm -hmm. But you know, this other guy's not going to get away with not being able to do it. Okay. So transparency, because one of the troubles with transparency, it might, might be nice to say you're transparent. But if I'm not, then I kind of win. Mm -hmm. So you're going to force people to be transparent on those kind of issues. Uh, women on boards, I mean, I've always been confused by this because every time you see women CEOs, women on boards, you do better. Fundamentally, your returns are higher. But male companies tend not to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, governments are saying, smarten up, we'll put it in a regulation. You've got to disclose your boards, you've got to blah, 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 blah. Right. And then you force them to do it, and everybody goes, and it's easy, then you can go back to your shareholders who might, you know, a bunch of male shareholders might bitch about putting, oh, we've got too many women on the board, but, <laughs> well, the regulator made us do it. Right. It's kind of like gay marriage in the states. Every state opposed it, but they knew they were going to get overthrown because the government, the Supreme Court already ruled. It's that kind of thing. The regulator tells me to do this. Sorry, guys, got to kind of happen. So, yeah, you don't like climate change, don't really care. Regulator tells me to do it. Right. Phil, that's, uh, that's great input. Thanks very much for joining us today. Well, I'll be back soon. Terrific. Thank you. How do you feel about a federal regulator, Edward, as opposed to the provincial structure we have now? Well, I guess the idea is to make a more of a level playing field, right? But, I mean, Canada's so diverse across, like, it's such a big country. Like, our, our different provinces, I mean, we're all people, but... Not all of us. There's different cultures, Some right? Some of us are robots, I robo mean, you, you know, like, uh, Easterners are not anywhere near, like, the British Columbia people. They're especially not. in the investment There's a lot world. of people in British Columbia from the east, though. Really? Yeah. Maritimers, we yeah, call well, them. Yeah, because they, they all went Some west. Of, yeah. Well, do you know James why the west. trees in Ontario... This is a joke that was told in B.C. during my time there. Do you know why the trees in British Columbia lean towards the east? Why? Because Ontario sucks. Which, now that I'm back in Ontario, I take a grave offense at and I uh, kick any B.C. guy's ass. Who oh, asked me that question? No, but uh, oh. kind of funny. Okay. Here you have it. But well, so yeah, what do you yeah, think yeah, the chances are, though? I mean, as, as, as the point was made in that clip, uh, it's been 80 years that... The provinces have been fighting the feds against a federal unified regulator. And now we've got everybody signed on except Quebec and Alberta. Are Quebec and Alberta sufficient to derail the entire conversation at this point? Yeah. But what are you going to do with all these, these, these provincial regulators? They, they don't want to lose their jobs. No, that's true. So the, you've got to figure out how to replace their incomes. Wouldn't it just be then that there'd be, instead of the New Brunswick Securities Commission, it would just be the New Brunswick branch of the Canadian Securities Commission? Like yeah. the SEC has offices all over Hell's Half Acre. Yeah, I think, I think that's So what go. really would be the improvement? No, no, no improvement. No improvement. No improvement. Would it make the cost of listing a company lower because you've got one regulator to feed no. instead of 12, 10? No, because you'd still have to feed the other ones. Really? Well, what are you going to do with them? You take, you know, put them out of work. Put them out of work. Put them Just out like of work. that. Don't, you don't put the government people out of work. Why not? It doesn't work that way. Why not? I would, first of all, if I was running a public company, I think that would be one of the pers first people I'd like to hire as my compliance officer. <laughs> what? You used to run a federal <laughs> securities regulator? How right. about you do compliance? No, we never had a compliance here before. No. Um... Okay, so what else is going on today, Edward? Nobody has come up with a good reason for stocks to suddenly be taking off. Could this maybe be the beginning of the end of tax loss? That's when they take selling? off. The t end of tax loss selling season? No, they, they, they go up. When nobody knows when why. The selling, when the selling slows down. When the music stops. Look, they've been, we've been, they've been destroyed. We saw it happen back then, and then we had to take over. And remember, they went up daily yep. for, for a few months. Wow. Didn't they? Mm-hmm. James Albert has a question. This is a good question. James Albert wants to know, hey, Head and James, I know this ain't a weed show specifically, but curious which products personally you've tried and what has impressed you? What positive reviews are you hearing? Love the show. James Albert, that is a many faceted question, a many headed hydra in response. What products have we tried? I mean, boy, how much time have you got? Uh, let's see, I'm, I'm going to narrow this down. Well, just, just say you tried them all. Well, no, I haven't you tried haven't them tried all. Them all. Because now there are more products than, you know, back yeah. when I first started sampling cannabis products, uh, you know, you had a very finite group of products from which to choose. So right, right. at any given time, in any given market, and a market being a city, call it like St. Catharines, right, Niagara Falls, right, Toronto, right, right, right. you know, there was either like some great Afghani hash going around, the ubiquitous Mexican 
bunkweed, and if you were lucky, some California sensimia. And, uh, and you know, that was it. Maybe some oil, maybe some blonde hash. Like, there were a few things. There were a few yeah. different things to try. Now, now it's like every time I turn around, there's some new brand. Yeah. Every time I go to somebody's house in California, it's like they've got a cigar box of some expertly designed new brand that I've never heard of. Every time I go to a dispensary, <laughs> You know, the, the list of products that were there the last time I was there a couple months ago have been moved out and there's a new range of products. So, all that being said, which products do, uh, do I like? Personally, of all the ones I've tried, my favorite product in the cannabis space right now is the Sunset Oil from Green Relief, which is 44 milligrams per milliliter of broad spectrum CBD with less than 0.3% THC. 0.3 right. milligrams per milliliter THC. So there's zero THC effect. So if you see that combination on another product, would you try that product to see if it's... Yeah, I would try it. Yeah, you like that combo. It. Well, I've since I've become a patient of Green Relief, I have no reason to change from them. And, okay. Uh, you know, they, brand, brand loyalty. Well, brand loyalty, and uh, I think I'm going to buy some of the stock in their Go Public rounds, so kind of, you know, why not if you're going to... Yeah offset the cost of my medication with some uh, participation on the equity side, especially if they go public after all this nonsense ends and the market's back in the pink or the green. Interesting. Yeah. But uh, do you still do you still like smoking like say a, THC? A, a number like a joint? Yeah, I like to, you know, but here's the thing I've noticed is that because I, was, I think it's because I was such a chronic for so long that now I have one puff of like 12 grams per uh, 12 milligrams THC. I'm high. I had two puffs and I'm no longer sociable. So not really into smoking THC rich pot anymore. Been there, done that, doesn't do anything for me anymore. Mind you, if I'm sick or if I've got, you know, I don't know, I can't imagine what condition I would have that would induce me to do that. A really bad hangover. I would smoke some weed with good THC content, but uh, no, I think that every, I think there's a whole generation of new users are going to find out that the more you smoke, the higher your sensitivity actually becomes, and you need less to get the same effect. And depending on your state of mind, it becomes unpleasant over time. Do, do you think all these products have a, a to your to your comment about about becoming sort of resistant to them? Do you think the more you smoke, the less it affects you? No, I think the opposite is true. Really. The more you smoke, the more sensitive you become to it. So, so you, you need, need less and you less need over less time. And less. So eventually, you don't need any. Well, that's because, because I'm at that point now. Your brain's fried. <laughs> well, no, actually, the, I think the thing Health is. Health Canada, pay attention. I think I think the thing is, as you age, you find that your the mental capacity you have to actually think things through and to make good decisions, as you get more mature, you realize that that is so limited. But that is such a finite resource that the last thing you should be doing is, you know, torching a bunch of it through some recreational cannabis use. Right. Because, you know, just look at you, Eddie. You're 67. Now you can't remember a damn thing. What? <laughs> well, exactly. Who wants to end up like that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think a lot of people, a lot of people would like to lose their memories because, you know, that, your memory is what makes you depressed. Well, there's been, I've seen some uh, anthropological cannabis scientists suggest that the short-term memory loss that cannabis causes is regarded as a survival mechanism for primitive tribes to uh, survive and evolve forward because short-term concern is what generally prevents you from taking care of longer-term real issues. So if you're always focused on right, the immediate right, things, right, like, right, oh my right, God, God, my I, shoes aren't dead, my, 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 my pencil's not like shot, this is, my bank These are built-in sa evolutionary safeguards, yeah. perhaps. If you can't remember yeah. everything, of course you're going to be in a good mood. Like, oh, let's see, I was, am I up or down in my portfolio? Ah, who cares, I'm high. <laughs> I feel groovy. What I'm high, so I must be up. Yeah. Interesting. That's the theory of the day. Anyways, let's go see what other brilliant questions. So anyways, sorry. I really feel that we didn't answer James Albert's well, question there so, very well. well so my personal favorite product is the Sunset uh, Sunset Oil from uh, from uh, Green Relief. See, there goes my short-term memory again. 
And uh, mind you, I did have a very fun experience uh, with some THC product recently, but it was uh, it was it was not um, it was not legitimate THC product. It was uh, craft cannabis, as as we call it in polite circles. Right, craft cannabis. Growers. Right, right, right. Unlicensed craft cannabis producer. How about you, Ed? You know, I, I don't pay that much attention to uh, if what it, it if is. It's got THC, a little bit of buzz, you know, a little buzz. I, I've I saw some photographs of you last weekend, and you looked pretty high. And it was smoking those big cannons. <laughs> those bad cannons? Well, you were away. Oh, wow. Please, well, the cat's That's pretty away. funny. Well, that's interesting. So, uh, so what's your favorite THC product out there? I, 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 don't, I don't know how to answer that. I don't well, know we had that. some stuff from Aurora. Was that good? Yeah. And we had some stuff from, uh, from Organogram. Was that good? Yeah. Have you had any bad? Yeah, I, I, you know what? If you just like say you know wanted CBD, hmm. I can't see the point of doing CBD. I don't have very much, uh, very many afflictions. Like no. you know, like I don't need pain relief. No, no, no pain. Not what really. What about anxiety? Yeah, yeah, a little bit of anxiety. You know, like that's a that's a future th uh, fear of the future. Yeah, anxiety, fear of the future, depression, fear of the past. Right. You know, one of my favorite sayings is. Uh, Worrying is like paying the rent on a house that you never move into. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's no, the no. point? What's the point? I mean, it's gone, right? You can't do anything about it. Don't worry. Be happy. Okay. Okay. No, enough of that. Back I'd like to, to some know why, serious I'd like to know here. why hemp's up uh, from eighty cents to a buck fifty. That's a big I know move. why. I know why. More buyers and sellers. No, but there's, people are looking at things, and just when you least expect it, maybe there's a big short position there, and somebody's decided to cover. Well, I, I don't know. Yeah, who knows? 40, 48 How many shares north. out on that? I don't know. I, I, I can't look it up right now because my computer was... Uh, Where's your computer? Is they it don't want me to look at it. They'd... Really? You're not allowed your computer? I've been, I've been bad. Your toy's been taken away. What did you do to deserve that, Ed? Oh, you know. It was, must have been pretty grim. But I, I get it. I get it. So uh, now after the market's closed, uh, Liberty Health Sciences is actually the, oh, that's in the Midas letter port, no, small cap index. Uh, the biggest performer on a percentage basis is Liberty Health Sciences, now at $1.06, up 11.58% at the end of the day. Isa Dial turned in an 8% increase, up 13 cents to a buck 77. Wow. Organogram was up that's hilarious it was up over to five and a quarter and now it backed off to 497 but still up 23 cents or 4.85 percent on the day now in the csc space let's take a look at who are the big winners who are the big losers on a percentage basis the big loser blg don't even know who they are afi afinor growers with second month at 20 cents that's a four cent stock so who cares let's look at the percentage gainers and again Liberty Health Sciences is in the lead, up. No, nope. what? Sorry, NF, what is NF? We don't know what NF is. Do you know what NF is, Ed? No, no. Anyways, seven cents, up 15, 3.38 cents. Shouldn't really count as a penny stock that low, but uh, yeah, Liberty Health Sciences leads the pack on the CSE. Again, up 12% practically, followed by Lifestyle Delivery Systems, uh, Pivot, PTX, is that Pivot Technologies? QCC, don't know who they are, Arib. You know what company I've been wanting to look at and see how they're doing because they made this announcement where they've acquired an Oregon grower for $160 million of stock. $160 million, that's acreage, acreage holdings. So, I'd like uh, to know who, who uh, put that little deal together? Acreage holdings? I couldn't tell you, but let's go look at the chart for acreage. Uh, that would be acrg.u colon cnx. You, you know what? Uh, okay, look at that. Yeah. It has had a tough time. And what, what was that done at? 25? 25 bucks was and the And where is it now? 1750. So basically shed a third of its value. A third of its value. Gone. Yeah. Gone. Gonzo. Yeah. But more importantly, look at the volumes. Drawing right up here. 
Now that yeah, again, these these things they're, they're they're free. Yeah, well, they're not. They're, they a lot of their uh, stock is not free trading, right? In a, a lot of these deals that were done. Oh, there's escrowed stock. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. You well, know, Planet uh, PLTH. I can't remember the, the Planet Thirteen. Planet Thirteen. That's been dropping. That's dropped a lot. That's down to dollar thirty-seven or dollar thirty-eight. Well, it had quite a run. So you know. Well, all those yeah, yeah, and only one the one entertainment. Uh, Store, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's it's four twenty on the button. Look at even here's uh, four twenty on the button. Four twenty on the button. Well, I want to just point out before we swap to our daily feature that uh, Soul Gold, which is uh, Anthony or uh, oh the Tony uh, De Francesco's uh, Pubco that was the one that sold all the assets to Afria. Uh, is up 31 cents, up 22% on the day to $1.69. Wow. Went as high as $1.74 today. Anyways, yeah, you, you know, so you, you, there's so much for the short strategists. It looks like they uh, lost I, I know, but, but, but you know what? They had their way for a while, and now they're not going to. It's like... Three days. There's days. There's days up, and they're like it's like... Days off. During the day, the sun's out. At night, it's not. <laughs> Well, the sun is still out. It's just the planet has rotated and you're okay. no longer okay. able to see it. No, no, Anyways, I, enough of that shit. Okay. Here is the daily feature. It's been said that there are over 200 million cannabis users worldwide. And with legalization in Canada, there are a lot of first time users who aren't sure how cannabis will affect their bodies. Uh, so I've been smoking cannabis for about three years now. So actually, quite frankly, Right now, it doesn't affect me too much. It's uh, I smoke just enough to kind of level out some anxiety and some uh, like to enable some social interaction with people. So Andrew, when you smoke cannabis, how does it affect your body? Sure. So it definitely has negative effects for me. Um, I feel lightheaded. I have no energy. I feel like I'm going to pass out. So it, it's definitely not something that I do on a regular basis, if if ever. So yeah, me and weed uh, don't really get along too well. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, well, well I, so am I. So we found a company that has created a simple DNA test that will help determine the short and long-term effects cannabis will have on you. Global Genetics is a company that is ensuring a safer cannabis experience through genetics. A lot of people don't know that cannabis actually is influenced by genetics that you inherit when you're born. So there are three markers we're testing for as a cannabis genetics company. First, we're testing how your body metabolizes cannabis. The second marker we're testing is your long-term risk factors of use. And the third marker we're testing is when you take cannabis, will you suffer from neurocognitive impairment? So that's a fancy way of saying, will you have short-term memory loss? There's two consumers for the test. One is obviously the medical market. So this would be you are getting a cannabis prescription and your doctor wants to understand more accurately how you respond to it. Another segment that we think is actually much larger is the adult use market. And this would actually be sold as a direct consumer genetic test where we intend to have our device in physical locations like dispensaries, retail locations, also online. And the consumer, like other genetic testing companies, you'll be able to order it directly from us and we will provide you the result in as little time as 45 minutes. From a simple cheek swab, we're taking a sample of your DNA. And from that DNA, we're actually testing it in our device that's the world's smallest DNA analyzer. So it's about four inches cubed. And what's happening inside the machine is we're actually amplifying your DNA billions of times using a advanced technology called PCR, or the polymerase chain reaction. I'm gonna be swabbing myself right now. Yeah, and you're gonna do one at a time. One at a time, start with lucky number one. Start with number one. Now you have my DNA. Okay, so I've done my DNA test, now we just have to wait and see for the results. I mean, if Jerry Springer taught us anything about DNA tests, I'm probably gonna be the father. But let's find out together in studio. For Midas Letter Live, I'm Madame Barbieri. Boy, a little uh, fast and free with the DNA there, aren't you? A little Emma? weird, yeah. Doing yeah. That <laughs> so what's the uh, what's the upshot? Are All you right. gonna die? Hey. No, I'm <laughs> exactly. I'm boy. Yes. Trusting. You're been there, been there, done that. It was an interesting process, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I found out 
so I metabolize THC pretty normally. 80, okay. Yeah, I guess 80% of the population metabolizes it normally. Okay. Uh, Short-term, long-term effect, uh, increase in likelihood of triggering acute psychosis following hmm. consumption. You've got a tendency towards psychosis. Yeah, I like that. Good to, well, <laughs> don't fire this guy until everybody's got a vest on. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, Be generous I'm, with the Christmas bonus. I'm more likely to have difficulty remembering short-term events. <laughs> I'm, okay, I'm okay with that, too. I can live with that. That's a good yeah, thing yeah, in many yeah, cases. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, okay. you have you don't your short term is a little well, but I I I've noticed it based on my my uh, you know gradual uh, increase in age. Oh, like yeah. it seems like now you know I I walk into a room and I think what the hell did I just do where, that where, for? Where am I? And you know where's where's my, my glasses? It's yeah. they're on my head. Like well, the first you, you thing know, I remember about uh, the funny side effects of smoking weed is when I think I put my uh, I think I put my cell phone in the fridge when I got home. <laughs> recently and thought, geez, that's, uh, that's yeah. got to be a it's good high. for the battery. Yeah, well, yeah. good point. <laughs> but, but okay, so how do we get our DNA tested if we want to so, check that out? So they are in some dispensaries in, in provinces that are allowed dispensaries right now, mm -hmm. but in the new year, they're hoping to be, you know, in Toronto and everywhere that oh, they okay. can be. Uh, it's 45 minutes and they send it right to your phone. I know I got the paper here, but they're... Uh, what do they uh, charge? That's a great question. They, that's what we didn't talk about. Oh, really? Yeah. So they didn't charge you, obviously. They didn't charge me now. I'm all oh, about the wow. freebies. Well, maybe if we uh, go and say, you know what? That test you did with the demo, that was good, yeah. but what about us? Yeah, let's try we it need again. To do it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Huh, very interesting. And that took a, a very short period of time. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I, I think a lot of people are going to be interested in this because there are a lot of new users. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know a few friends who've never really smoked and now because it's legal they're like let me order it let me try it out really yeah I'm, and I've been smoking a lot more because it's legal like it's easier oh okay yeah. the control yeah. room advises that it costs about a hundred bucks oh. and it's three swabs three swabs 45 minutes and you, you three know. swabs and you're out three swabs and you're out <laughs> the old ball game that's hilarious yeah okay so what else what else was did you learn there like so what's the so what if people 80 percent of people metabolize it differently yeah no, normally so normally. so the 80 percent of the population uh, metabolizes THC normally I'm part of that 80 percent except your pro propensity for psychosis exactly that's where it's different <laughs> that's a bit concerning eh? I'd be a little worried I'm a about loose that. Cannon, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, we gotta watch what we say around this guy when he's high. Yeah, that's right. No, huh. it's interesting. I guess like I didn't know that the DNA could really give you these answers about. So I guess going forward, it, it'll help you when you're. Considering. So just as we saw in some of your interview segments, some people said that I don't it. enjoy enjoy getting high. Is this DNA test a way to tell reliably whether this individual is going to enjoy it or not? I think so. I mean, it, I think it shows how you, especially the metabolizing THC, how, okay. how, how your body can handle that THC. Huh. So I'm, I think it'll get to the point where they can even say, you know, what strain you can, you know, what strain's better, you know, this level of THC is probably not going to be good for you or, you know, higher CBD and, you know what I mean? That, right, right, yeah. right. So I think... Uh, well, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I had no idea that was, this was a, a thing. <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. Yeah, that's uh, So where did you go to get this done? Uh, Lobo Genetics, it's, they're based out of Toronto. Okay. Yeah, and... Uh, How much does that uh, contraption cost, you think? Was it was that 100 bucks, or was it just the test? I think bucks? the test is 100 They yeah. charge you a t $100 to test you, but... I, I don't think they're selling them yet to consumers. I think they're just in dispensaries right now. You know, right you can now. get your own blood pressure uh, monitor. Yeah. Maybe you should get your own DNA monitor. Might Check, well, make yeah. sure you got DNA. Maybe some people don't have DNA. DNA. Really? <laughs> what? What do you know? Are you high right now? Well... <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean? You've got DNA all the time. You can't not have DNA yeah. sometimes and sometimes. Well, what if yeah. you're what if you're uh, a cat or something like that? <laughs> Cat's got DNA. So you are high. Anyways, uh, what's that message on the screen say? Adamo's a psycho killer. Ooh, oh, I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> Adams. He's got you as Adams. Adams. Yeah. I'll, I'll take Adams. Adams. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have to stand on an exact uh, <laughs> no. you know recognition here. Anyway, so uh, the. Um, DNA thing is, you know, good for people who want to go and see if they're going to yeah, enjoy how getting fair. high. Yeah, I, I, not, yeah, I guess enjoy, sure, but it's just how your body will react. Uh, so is their business offering DNA testing to people on the street who want to see what their DNA says about or their likely response to this is? So they're going to be in clinics and dispensaries and, and available online as well. So I don't think they're going like on the street, but I think they're... What, what, what about if you uh, 
uh, you you want to get like you've never been high, you've never indulged in cannabis, and then you want to, can you go get your DNA tested and they can then tailor make tailor make a uh, a high experience for you and say, well, you're going to like this because of your DNA. I it, would think so. Is that would, where it's going? I would think that's where it's going. I would say that's you're, where you're the whole say, evolution well, you know, is going. You, like, like, you like CBD. Custom. Well, I like CBD in combination with other drugs. Yeah, but not like necessarily what? cannabis. Ecstasy. Oh, like, like heroin. <laughs> 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 and you don't do heroin. Are you on heroin right now? No. Okay, I've never done heroin. Just I've never done heroin. Because sometimes don't ask me anything else. <laughs> I, I don't, you know, I don't even, what about some of these, uh, never mind, let's not talk Anyways, about uh, stop there. <laughs> this Crystal week math. we're also going to have, uh, we're going to have some vape people in the, in the house. We're going to have a whole bunch of other things coming up this week. What was the other one that I was just thinking of? I can't remember. Anyways, uh, yeah, join us tomorrow. We're going to be here again with a whole bunch of guests. Don't forget, we've got both Bruce Linton and Cam Batley here on Friday. That's our show for today. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Thank you.